Hello, Space Club sites, and welcome back to another special broadcast of Space Club Career Chats. I hope you guys are having an awesome semester. Keep those submissions coming. Um, some schools are just getting started with their mission patch and spacesuit. Others are already at that rover challenge, and it's just been really cool seeing all your designs. But today we have another special guest. So today is Dr. Roman Gomez. He's a lead research scientist in the Space Science and Engineering Division at Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. He develops, calibrates, and assists with the implementation of and analysis of data from plasma instruments that are currently on spacecraft or shortly due to launch. Well, let's bring him on. Welcome, Dr. Gomez, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you for having me on, Natasha. Yeah, it's great to have you, and um, we're excited to kind of get your story. I know you do a lot of really cool technical work, um, but I think you're going to share a little bit about the technical side, but also just like your personal life. Absolutely, yeah, just to show you that uh, we don't have to be, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, one-dimensional people. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let me share your screen, and okay. I'll be back in a bit. Okay, so uh, just a quick rundown. So uh, what do I do for a living? And Natasha threw a whole bunch of words out there like calibration and stuff. And basically it boils down to, I built stuff, therefore I have stuff in space. When uh, I'm not looking at that stuff in space, those instruments, I have to think about it. And that's part of my job on a regular basis. And I kind of like that because that means that my job really never stops. And on the plus side, I love my job, so that's great. Um, I also have to go to conferences and talk about stuff in space. And uh, here, this is in, this is at the uh, eight, uh, American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco, and I conned the security guard into taking a picture of me like that. And then, more importantly, you know, I have to make sure that um, I talk to people, students like yourselves, about the joys of this profession, so that you know maybe others of you will want to join in with the fun. And so I end up teaching about stuff in space. I hear I'm teaching a class in astronomy. Uh, I also teach a class called the Physics of Superheroes. Uh, that's a really, really fun class to teach. I'm trying to work that into so I can teach it to, mul uh, teach to multiple platforms. So my backstory, yeah, I got some embarrassing family photos here. So this is my family, my mom and my dad, my brother, the family dog. Uh, I am a product of the San Antonio Independent School District. This is a third grade. Uh, I completed my high school education in 1988 and then joined the United States Army. Uh, was in the Army for a total of three years, then uh, came out, did a few jobs, and then finally started school at UTSA and then went to UT Austin. I ultimately graduated from Southwest Texas State University and uh, have my PhD in astrophysics from Rice. Uh, I am also a going to be a husband and I have two wonderful daughters. And, you know, things come full circle. You know, you go from being a member of a family to having a, man, a family of your own sometime. Those of you who wanted to know how long I was in school, here's a real quick one. Uh, went to Ines Foster Elementary for six years, <laughs> then uh, Connell Middle School, Highlands High School, and then joined the Army uh, from 1988 uh, to 1991 as an infantryman of all things, you know, not nothing real technical there. When I went to college, I originally was looking at being a medical doctor. And uh, so when I was at UTSA and at UT Austin, I was either a biology or biochemistry major. And then by the time I finished my schooling in biology, I had already caught the physics bug. It's like I tell people that I saw the light, turned to the dark side and never looked back. And so I ended up with a double major in biology and physics. And then uh, after that, I attended graduate school at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And that took eight years. Um, I actually, I ended up switching my specialties midway through. Um, originally, I was a astrophysicists looking for dark matter, which is supposedly 23% of the universe stuff that we haven't been able to see, measure, observe yet. And um, I finished my master's in that and then switched my field of study to space plasma instrumentation. Again, that's the stuff I build that we put on spacecraft and launch into space. Um, that 
now uh, I've been doing since I got my PhD in 2011. So, you know, 10 years. And honestly, it's just been very, very rewarding. Now, you know, you would think with all this education that, well, does he have time for anything? Well, the answer is absolutely. Yes, I do. I, I make time. You have no excuse not to make time. And so uh, I love hiking, love uh, going out to West Texas. Uh, it's just beautiful out there. Uh, another thing I've picked up, I've always been trying to be into fitness and I picked up Olympic weightlifting this year. It's uh, you know kind of daunting. I'm 51 years old. It's not exactly something you try to get into right off, but uh, you know, I'm enjoying it. And uh, I even go to anime conventions. This is my other, this is my daughter, Rudy. Um, you know, we find, uh, I'm actually, so this was at San Japan. This was in uh, September of this year. I've got another one I'm attending in December in Fort Worth. And then one next year that I'm attending in uh, Houston. So I, I kind of make my, I go and I actually talk about physics and anime and how they kind of represented. And so again, along with that, I get to travel, get to go to Mount Mushmore. Again, this is me acting silly at, in, um, in, uh, this is at Big Bend National Park. This is called uh, Balanced Rock, and I'm over there trying to pretend like I can lift that. So now to kind of give you an idea, I think I have a little bit of time, hopefully. Uh, I, I'm going to show you guys a video, see if I can get this back up and running. This I just competed in a, uh, a weightlifting competition this past weekend, and so this is kind of the buildup. Research Institute, and uh, I'm also a part-time college professor at Northwest Vista in St. Mary's, also teaching physics. It's one thing to lift, kind of, it satisfies me as a physicist, it's, it's one thing to lift weights moving at a constant speed. And it's another thing entirely to try to accelerate them so you can get underneath them uh, while they're in free fall. So, uh, yeah, it's it's very challenging. Uh, you know, I think what got me trying this is I actually was at Gold's Gym and I tried to do snatch one time and uh, and just with an empty bar and felt flat on my butt. And I said, you know, uh, if I'm going to try this, I'm going to need to get a trainer. And so I reached out and a personal friend recommended me to Rogelio. And, strong uh you know all the technique that uh, is required you know we've been working it and uh you know Rogelio's just been very you know dogged on the technique making sure that i you know, do things correctly you know and, and and one of the things i really enjoy about working with him is that you know you've got repetition that repetition makes things work makes things second nature and uh so I, you know going into my first meet which is really exciting and kind of intimidating i, I feel really good I feel really good
Well, are you just it trying to make scientists look cool? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. I'd like to think we are. <laughs> no, I, I love that you shared that video um, because I a lot of the students have this stereotype of when we hear scientists, they think like Big Bang Theory, right? Like super nerd, which we have to admit that scientists are nerds. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, but you have like so many different layers, just like any other person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I, I love that you shared all those sides. And if you have a couple more minutes, I'd love to ask you some more questions from By you. Um, so you alluded to this question, how long did you go to college for and just school in general? And I, have you done the math on how many years total? Well, so yeah, it was, uh, so 12 years, well, actually like 13, if you include kindergarten, right? So 13 yeah. years, you know, from, uh, uh, from kindergarten to high school, then college, I bounced around. So that was seven years. So that, yeah, at that cool. point we're at like. 19 years right is that what it is yes and then grad school was uh eight so yeah i got almost a little bit over two decades <laughs> that i was yeah, in 36 years is what i added <laughs> yeah it is and again you know there was some time i took a, a year off in college and i didn't go to college right after high school because i joined the military you know there were some right. things in there and and they were learning experiences as well you know there were certain things that i needed to develop certain disciplinary attitudes and uh the, the military was really good for that i i think one of the concerns that students have they're like oh my gosh that's so much school how do you approach school and learning in general because i think kids are afraid of it and see it as just a burden you know it, it's it's funny um my father always told me that education was a reward in and of itself and and that nothing worth having was ever going to be an easy thing to attain. You know, um, I think I think maybe, and I don't know if my, my statistics may be biased, but I think it's like 16% of the American population has a bachelor's degree. 1% hmm. um, has a PhD in physics, and probably about 1% of that has a PhD in astrophysics. It's and, and it's the most rewarding, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done, but it was not easy to get here. And it's kind of like with lifting the weights, you know, I want to compete, but I'm, if I'm just walking into the gym, like once a month and, you know, like, okay, I'm going to get stronger. That's can be then diluting myself. So if, if it's something you want, if it's something you desire, and if it's something you love and, and never be afraid to fall in love with something like that then go after it with gusto you know throw your passion into it throw everything you are at it and you will give back you know and and all that time that you invested will seem like nothing you know it's like what well, this was time well spent that's how i feel i, I like the weightlifting analogy because it's you know different type of muscle you're trying yeah. to grow that brain um, yep. that thinking power um and one of the questions i had I want to see how you answer this. Um, do you really learn from your mistakes? How? Oh, yeah. This is a, a group of girls in Illinois. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I God, I tell my students this all the time, that you're looking at a creature that has been born and forged more from his mistakes than from his successes. And each of those mistakes, those, you know, problems with the calculation, or uh, maybe I didn't, I didn't measure something correctly on my apparatus or when I constructed it, there was something missing. And, and I learned from that. I didn't do that again. And that led to ultimately, you know, all successes are piled on a whole heap of, of you know, misdirection and mistakes. And it's OK. Um, and as a matter of fact, when you're studying, that's the time to make a mistake. Right. When, you, when you're in your class and you make that math mistake or something like that, don't feel bad about it and calculate it and, and, and make it a part of you and then say, OK, I'm not going to do that again, because uh, I think I was telling some students I was teaching engineering physics to. I said, look, wouldn't you rather make the mistake in this class and have me correct you and then you learn from it? than you be working on that multimillion dollar bridge and have a problem with your design or you be working on that multibillion dollar spacecraft and have a problem in your design and all of a sudden everything's broken. So yes, mistakes are important and you should learn from them. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your job. What is your least and most favorite part of your job? Let's see. The least favorite part of my job is paperwork. And and Did you say people. Paperwork. Oh, no, paperwork. no, no. Paperwork. <laughs> it's you know it. I like I like doing the experiments. Sometimes writing about them is always tough. And then in my field, you know, you have to write. And I'm not a bad writer. It's just that I'd much rather be in the lab doing things. And, and that's why I'm an experimentalist. But um, that being said, once you get into the rhythm of it, then it's not so bad. My favorite part, I just mentioned it. I love being in the lab. I love tweaking things. I love putting things together. I mean, again, that's why I chose to be an experimentalist and not just a theorist. I, I, I think if you're going to be an experimental physicist, you have to have a strong grasp of the theory, but you have to be able to work with your hands. You know, you've got to be able to use screwdrivers and learn how to build circuits and learn how to work with vacuum systems. And that's something I've always liked, just a visceral sense of the physicality of it. And, um, you know, that's not for everyone. You know, there are some people who like being modelers and theorists, people who are extraordinarily strong at mathematics, and they end up going that route. So, but I, again, I like, I like hands-on stuff. Uh, what are other types of people that you work with? Um, so we've had some other scientists. We've talked to a couple engineers. Do you work with other disciplines? Oh, yeah. Um, I work with chemists. I work with geologists. Hmm. I work with, you know, I work with people who are particle physicists. I work uh, very heavily with engineers because when I design an instrument, uh, you know, for ion optics or something like that, then I have to go and talk to the engineer to put it, to, to construct it for me. You know, um, it, it, it's a division of labor thing. Uh, and I, I, could I build the instrument? Could I design it? Yes. But the engineer is much faster. Uh, I work with computer programmers. Can I write code? Yes. But can I write it as efficiently as a computer programmer? No. That said, I do write code that is specific to my tasks. But when I need a more generalized code, I just call in a computer programmer. And we, we work very well together. And um, you know, it, it's really funny. Again, scientists are always kind of put forward in this like antisocial. I got to be social. I really do. I have to learn how to get along with people. And that being said, I've made some really great friendships with the people who I work with. It's just, you know, long time, long time. And I can always depend on them. Um, switching to more of your backstory, who was your greatest inspiration growing up? God. So, so a lot of people would expect it to be Einstein, but, uh, no. Enrico Fermi is my favorite physicist because he embodied this kind of equal and amazing potential in both experimental and theoretical physics. That's that if that was who I would aspire to be. He was just a neat guy. And at one time he had under his employ one of the kind of like one of the greatest collections of minds. This was in Italy mm. and just really, really sharp guy. Uh, he worked on the Manhattan Project. I mean, those are my I think that would be the most in, in that would be the greatest inspiration. So as a kid, how did you come across him? Was it in a class? You found a book? I found a book. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, I, I was, I was kind of a World War II buff when I was a kid. And, um, you know, you, you read about these physicists who, who participated in the Manhattan Project. And the one, again, who really kind of struck me was Enrico Fermi. You know, it, that project basically hinged on his know-how if he if he was not there they would not have been able to perform the reactions required in order to you know get the products they needed and uh, i always thought that was cool to be like that one guy that you mm -hmm. have to depend on that that one person that uh, is the crux you know it always it always fascinates me how even though we have all these great collective uh efforts all of the advances are generally made at the individual level one scientist or you know one engineer it, you know and that means that everybody has a part to play and that one piece 
fits into this giant lattice that is, you know, either a success or a failure. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. One more question for you. Um, this kind of feels like an interview question, but I think it's good. So Team Apollo wants to know, where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> um, hopefully still still lifting weights. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, in addition to that, um, God, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, I could see myself possibly as in a, in a higher leadership role than I already am on the current projects that I'm in. But otherwise, that I'm 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 happy where I am, you know. Um, this again, that that whole thing. My father told me, find something you love to do, get paid to do it, and you'll never work a day in your life. And I honestly have not worked for the past 14 years, and I don't intend to start anytime soon. Um, will I have opportunities to field more instruments? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, I have two upcoming missions. One is going to be ma making a measurement of the solar wind, we will be, I am designing the solar wind instrument for the next almost decade. Wow. That's kind of an honor. Um, yeah. I've got another instrument that's gonna be in near earth orbit. We just finished the review of another instrument. I'm providing a, providing a similar instrument to that mission and that one would launch, because we have two launching in 2024 and that one would launch in 2026. So, I mean, I'm spoken for and uh, that's, kind of a good feeling. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. And we will bring you back, um, I think, for more Space Club career chats to kind of see your progress. Sure. And also in weightlifting. Good luck with that oh, thank you. <laughs> tournament. But before we end, I would love to share with you some of the highlights of this week of the Space Club students. Okay. So let me pull those up. Um, oh, I have your screen. Let me change oh, yeah, my screen. Oh. I got it. <laughs> okay. So these are um, some of the projects from this week. They, this is a school, Calvary Christian School, in Illinois. Um, we've, I see some robot hands down here at the bottom. This is hard to tell, but they're actually learning about hydroponics up here, which is actually a pretty critical technology that NASA is developing. Yeah, when I was in high school, ahead. when I was in high school, I actually worked on hydroponics, and oh, no way. so the. So the, the, the we were already talking about it back there, you know, in, in those ancient days when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But, you know, um, yeah, I think it's amazing that that has moved forward in the way that it does, because that's, you know, for colonization purposes, hydroponics yep. is absolutely vital. And good tip, because the final project is to design a base on the moon. And so the kids need to keep in mind hydroponics as a potential cool. solution. Uh, so Anthony Akers in Wisconsin. Uh, so what they do, and I'm glad you shared your weightlifting. So the kids all tell us what their spark is, what they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so they create a mission patch that represents that. And then here at the end, can you tell what this is? That looks like an inclined plane, but. Yeah, they're trying to build a roller coaster. Okay, cool. I love yep. roller coasters so much. Uh, the best use of kinetic energy I know of. Yep. <laughs> All right, Cedar Drive Middle School in New Jersey. They have their spacesuit, which I just noticed there's like a cup coming out of the middle. I'm thinking is oxygen. I'm not sure what that represents. Any ideas? Or it could be a way to get nutrients into it. You know, I mean, there that's. Yeah. And then another hydroponics device. Uh, we have an international school in Kuwait, Indian Central School, that's participating. Uh, they're on their rover challenge. And so here they're transporting this rock sample they collected on the moon. And you can see some pretty creative designs. I think that's really important. You know, uh, that type of technology, if you're ever going to go and, and visit a planet, the first thing you want to do is send unmanned vehicles there. So and making them as, as intricate and as not complicated, but as capable as possible is really, really important. Another good tip for our base coming up. <laughs> uh, some more projects from Kuwait. This is the robot hand. Um, and so the idea with these robotic arms is this kind of extension to pick up samples and then the mm -hmm. rover transports it. And protecting a manned mission is, you know, mm -hmm. of utmost importance. So yeah, any way you can do it. A few roller coaster designs here um, from Magazine School in Arkansas. And we connected this to the Vomit Comet in astronaut training and experiencing changes in acceleration. Mm -hmm. 
hopefully their roller coaster does not cause people to vomit. But <laughs> well, those are the only good ones, though. I uh, guess if that's your goal. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think this is our last one. Wilkins uh, Junior High, in Illinois, also doing their robotic arm. And I will say, guys, this is one of the hardest challenges um, because it seems simple but it's really intricate to create all the fingers and to make all these movable parts. So I just want to say good job to all the teams. Absolutely. Um, all right. So the final part that the kids are all excited for is the raffle. And we've given away NASA swag and microscopes. And this week our team is going to get a headset for augmented reality or virtual reality. And so you could actually do a roller coaster. There's a really cool VR um game and there's like an underwater adventure there is um space so you could be like an astronaut on the moon exploring the moon so i really am cool jealous stuff. i am jealous you're jealous all right well let's see who wins this um let me pull up our picker wheel last time i did this it played an advertisement so i hope okay good <laughs> it's always brought to you by somebody um so we i think it was over 50 teams submitted this week so let's see who our winner is. Congratulations, my luster Stevens Junior High, the Turtle Knees Shuttle. What a unique name. <laughs> All right, I am going to be contacting your teacher. Um, but as we wrap up this uh, Space Club career chat, Dr. Gomez, do you have any final words of advice or thoughts for our students? I mean, I, I think I, I can't focus enough on passion and 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 um, and having grit because you know it sounds funny. The only person who can motivate you is you. Ultimately, mm -hmm. teachers can try to push you forward, but you're going to have to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Now, of that being said, you know you will find people who will be willing to mentor you and uh you know just never give up you know always eyes on the prize push forward look for people like me who are more than happy to mentor and uh you'll get to where you'll go where you want to go you'll get to get to where you want to be even if it takes you 36 years and if it takes you 30 or 40 years absolutely <laughs> it's worth it in the end absolutely all right well thank you again for joining us um, thank you for having me Great job to all the students. Uh, you guys have a great rest of your week, and I will see you next time. Okay. Bye. -bye.